it's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. I want to talk to you guys today about something that uh, I think needs to be discussed. I posted about it um, this morning, and uh, in the comments of the post, I saw more of the same, and I even I made it a point in the comments to, to let people know that I was going to be uh, coming on either here on Facebook Live or on YouTube to talk about it. And what I want to talk to you guys about is this, um, it, it's more than just, uh, what old crazy Joe said or did. And it's more than just the issue of the temple mount, but what got people started, I guess, talking about it again and bringing it to my attention was, uh, our president um, telling, you know, or saying that the the state of Israel, that the uh, Israelis uh, didn't have any right to the Temple Mount. And, you know, I, I have to be honest, I did not uh, hear or see the, uh, the announcement or whatever i didn't see where he said that you know so i'm not going to comment on what he did or didn't say or anything else what i am on here now to talk about is what christians some who i know and uh, respect are saying that they've said in the past um about other things and um that is that uh, america is now going to be under judgment and that we are now a cursed nation and I say we loosely um, because uh, you know I, I don't know about anybody else I'm not going to speak for anybody else but me personally I my citizenship is in the kingdom of God um, you know I consider myself a citizen of New Jerusalem and New Jerusalem is in the kingdom of heaven now that being said, there are many who um, are in the church, and I use the term church loosely as well, many who call themselves Christians who, you know, are followers of Christ, if in no other way in name, you know, they claim to be followers of Christ, they claim the name of Jesus Christ, but they are very patriotic not necessarily to the kingdom of God or to their king, Jesus, but to the United States of America. Um, and, you know, <laughs> the two seem to go hand in hand if, if you live in this country. You know, if, if you are not a patriot, then how could you be Christian? And... I am not here to comment on that. I am simply here to comment on what the Bible says in regards to the Jewish people. And when I say the Jewish people, I am just talking about flesh and blood Jews as well as the modern geopolitical nation state of Israel in the Middle East. When I say Israel today, I am in no way talking about the Israel of God. 
who I happen to be a part of. And whether you realize it or not, if um, you know you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, if you are a true follower of Jesus Christ, then you know you are uh, a part of Israel too. <laughs> you know you are an Israelite. Sorry, but you know if you disagree with me, you're not disagreeing with me. You're disagreeing with the Word of God. Now. We're going to go over some scriptures today, starting with the scripture that I have heard the most and seen the most on Facebook and in real life that people have quoted to me, even if they did not know the actual uh, book and chapter and verse that they were quoting from. And then you have others who did know because they actually posted on Facebook um, the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 12, verse 3. Okay, well, we're going to start there and, you know, we're going to see, you know, who, what, first, what that scripture says and second, who it was talking to. Um Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. If you have your Bibles, you may want to follow along just to make sure that the things I'm saying to you are true. Uh, hello, uh, Laron. Peace, brother. I uh, don't know if you've been on any of the uh, uh, Facebook Lives or episodes of either one of the programs that I have hosted in the past the uh, one I host now the uh, return of the historic faith or the remnant report that I hosted in the past but either way I am very happy that you decided to uh, come on and welcome peace to you grace and peace to you but Genesis chapter 3 I mean uh, Genesis chapter 12 verse 3 it says and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, every time, especially today in the past few days, that people quote this scripture, especially when it comes to the United States, um, they are quoting it as if it is talking about not just Israel in general, like the Old Testament um Awesome, brother. Awesome, because I'm definitely going to uh, point on, I'm going to talk about dispensationalism a little bit this morning, because dispensationalism, in my opinion, is not only the most uh, deceptive doctrine that the ch that is in the church today and has been for over 200 years, but it's also one of Satan's biggest tools to deceive believers. And he <laughs> uses it and has used it for over 200 years to infiltrate the church. And there are more dispensational believing Christians than any other uh, doctrine or belief system that there is. Because most people in the denominational system, even if it's not a full-on dispensational church they go to, some of the doctrines they hold are dispensational. Even if it's just uh, regarding the end times or uh, regarding things like what's going to take place in the millennial reign and stuff like that. But... Uh, I am going to touch on dispensationalism um, to point out where the spreading of this lie that if you bless Israel, you will be blessed. And if you curse Israel, you will be cursed because dispensationalism is the way that it has been spread through the church. Christian Zionism and dispensationalism are almost the same thing. And of course, dispensationalism um, was brought into the churches by the Zionist 
movement. If if you aren't willing to admit that it was political Zionist that brought and infiltrated the church with those doctrines, then there is no denying that Christian Zionism brought and has furthered dispensationalism through things like Dallas Theological Seminary is <laughs> the biggest tool that is used to spread dispensationalism across the United States and therefore the world because it is not only one of, if not the largest seminary in the country, but it's a dispensational uh, seminary and has been since its founding. But uh, I want to go back for a minute to the scripture, Genesis 12. Okay, let's see who the Lord was talking to here. Let's, let's not take scripture out of context. Let's go to verse 1, chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will shew thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So, I think it's fairly, fairly obvious that the scripture that I've seen posted on Facebook more times than I can count, just uh, yesterday and today, that were being used to say that since uh, Jode uh, told the Israelis they had no right to the Temple Mount, that that was the final nail in our coffin, is what one brother said. And the verse he used was this verse, Genesis 12, 3. But, and he also said in the post that same brother that made that post commented on my post about the subject and he uh, disagreed with me, of course, and, and I, I'm not looking for anybody to agree with me. I don't want to be right. Um, one thing that I said to him in my reply to his comment on my post was that you can go back and, and watch many of the episodes that I've done, and you can go back and listen to sermons I've preached any time that I have been wrong about something and the Lord has shown it to me either through somebody, uh, a brother or a sister, telling me something that led me to search it out for myself, or if it was just me looking in the scriptures, you know, studying the word of God, and I saw, hey, something that I have believed and taught, I was wrong about. I have made a point to come out and say publicly, hey, look, I taught this in the past. I was wrong. I apologize. And this is what the Bible actually says. So I could care less about being right. It, I mean, I have been wrong many, many times, many times. And I'm not going to say that I have always um, come out publicly and said, hey, I was wrong. And this is what the Bible actually says, but I will say that since I've been in the ministry, I certainly have. Anything I've taught from the pulpit or uh, done in a program, whether it be a podcast or a live stream, if I taught it and, I, and people listened to it and used what I said to make their doctrine, I have made a point to come out and apologize and say, hey, I, I'm, I'm human and I was wrong. And I, I would have to say that the biggest example of me being fallible is the fact that I am human. All human beings are fallible. And before I 
came into the, before I started in the ministry and even a little while after I was in the ministry, I was a hardcore dispensationalist. Um, you know, I um, was ordained in the Southern Baptist Church, preached in the Southern Baptist Church, grew up in the Southern Baptist Church, and was a hardcore pre-trib believer, uh, would argue people all day long, not because I was good at arguing it from the Bible, but I was good at arguing what I had been taught. Really, once I started reading the Bible for myself and seeing, hey, the things that I have been taught don't add up with what the Bible teaches, then as hard as it is to break out of that brainwashing that we all go through from <laughs> the time we enter the school system and when we're growing up in church, whatever uh, church we are a part of, whether we're Christians or not, we are being brainwashed, whether it's a good brainwashing or bad brainwashing. Um, you know, that is just the way our brains work. They're computers and they're biological computers and they store information. And the things that we learn at a young age are hardwired into us. They form our personalities. They form our worldviews, our belief systems. And that's why nothing short of the Holy Spirit is going to break down those strongholds. The blood of Jesus has been known to tear down any stronghold, including whatever you may or may not have been taught growing up. And so I want you to please look at the scriptures that I'm going to show you today and pray about this. I mean, even if you see the truth right there staring you in the face, it may not be easy for you to just see it as truth because a lot of times based on what we've been taught and based on what we believe, it we see what we want to see. Even if it's right there staring us in the face in black and white, we see what we want to see. I, I have seen that firsthand in talking with people using scripture. You know, I will show people that something the Bible says about something and it's right there in front of them. And there's always a yeah, but yeah, but. And that's because when people feel like you are attacking their worldview and anytime you're disagreeing with somebody and saying, hey, you're wrong, they they. They don't hear that you're trying to help them. What they hear is, hey, you're wrong and everybody who taught you that way is wrong. So they feel like, I know because I felt this way and I'm sure everybody does. We feel like that not only are we being attacked and what we believe is being attacked, but that our the people that we love and taught us these things we feel like they are being attacked that's that's what people hear so i'm telling you this so you'll know when you are talking with someone whether you're sharing the gospel with someone who was raised in a, another religion or whether you are talking to a christian who just has um beliefs and doctrinal views that uh you know go against the doctrine of christ Always remember that you must, must, must do it in love and you must make sure that people know that you are not attacking them. You are not attacking the people who taught them. I make it a point to say, hey, you know, I was taught the same when I'm talking to dispensationalist. I make it a point to say, hey, I was taught the same things that you were taught. You know, uh, my, my mom loved me. My dad loved me. And they taught me what they thought was right. And before I realized that dispensationalism was false doctrine, I taught my kids the very same thing and had to reteach them. And I'm going to tell you something. Um, it's not easy to reteach uh, children once they get past a certain age and all of my children were, not all of them, all but my youngest were uh, at least 15 by the time I went into the ministry. And so, you know, <laughs> that was a battle 
by itself. But I, I know that I've kind of ran it a little bit, but I, I wanted to make it clear that for those of you who see this and you disagree with me, I want you to know I'm not attacking you. I'm not attacking your belief system. I am simply showing you the truth from the word of God, not thus saith Jeremy. The things I'm showing you today are thus saith the Lord. I just did an episode of Return of the Historic Faith uh, that hopefully will be up before the week's out. Um, and in that episode, it was a Bible prophecy episode, and I made it a point to say, hey, the things that I am uh, saying today are not thus saith the Lord. These are my opinions. These are not, uh, you know, things that are facts that are clear in Scripture. I think they're very easy to see, and I think that the Scripture shows them clear, but not clear enough that I'm going to tell you this is 100% fact, thus saith the Lord. That's not the way it is today. This is thus saith the Lord from the Word of God. Now, we've already seen that Genesis chapter 12 is talking to Abraham. Now, I didn't go any further down past uh, verse 3 because there's really no need to because that's the verse that everybody quotes when uh, God tells Abram, he's not even Abraham yet, he's Abram at this point, when God tells him that he will bless those who bless him and curse those who curse him and that through him, all families of the earth will be blessed. Now, the next scripture that I want to look at and the next point I want to make is um, I want to look at, we're going to go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28, but I want, I want to point something out. Um, God did make almost the same promise to the nation the Old Testament nation of Israel that he made to Abraham as far as the blessing and curses. But every promise that was made to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament was a conditional promise. And I think most of us who have read the Bible and who study the Bible, regardless uh, to where we fall on the theological spectrum know that these were conditional promises. Israel would be blessed themselves if they what? If they upheld the covenant. If they did their part. And if not, then the, the opposite would happen. So I, I want to look at, I want to go to uh, the uh, book of Deuteronomy chapter 28 really quick. And we're going to look, uh, we're going to, I want to go to, uh, we're going to look at Deuteronomy 28, 37, but we're also going to look at uh, 63 and 64. But first, I just, uh, I just want to turn to Deuteronomy 28 really quick. All right, now. In verse, verse 37, actually before we read verse 37, I want to go down a little further to what the Lord tells the children of Israel will happen to them if they do not keep the covenant, if they do not obey the laws of the covenant and the commandments and ordinance, ordinances of the covenant. The Lord tells them in Let's see, as far as curses go, the Lord tells them, starting in verse, let's just start with verse uh, 45. He says, moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed. 
because thou hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy seed for ever. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore shall the Lord, therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he has destroyed thee. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, corn wine, or oil. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high and fence walls come down, wherein thou trust, uh, trustedest throughout all the land. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates through all thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. Uh, I want to go down a little further to verse 60. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou which thou wast afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. And also every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the book of this law, which then the Lord, which them will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. And ye shall be left few in number, whereas ye were as the stars of heaven, as a multitude, because thou would not obey the voice of the Lord thy God. And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you and bless you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught, and ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from one end of the earth even unto the other, and there Thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even gods of wood and stone. And among these nations thou shalt find no ease. Neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest, but the Lord shall give thee a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind. All of these things that God is telling the children of Israel here that are going to happen to them, are things he's saying are going to happen if they do not keep the covenant, if they do not obey his commandments. Now, before he says all of these things, in the beginning of Deuteronomy 28, he tells them of all the blessings that shall come on thee and overtake thee, if they shall hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shall be shall thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall thy basket and thy store. Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shall thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. Then the Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses. And the Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself, as he hath sworn unto thee, if, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. And all people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, and the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath, if thou 
hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I commanded thee this day to observe and, and do them. And then in verse 15, that's when it starts. But it shall come to pass, if thou will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and statutes, which I command thee this day, all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. See, it is actually Israel who was told that they would either be blessed or cursed. And the Lord did say that if they followed him, if they kept his commandments, if they uh, followed his statutes and kept the covenant, then all the nations of the earth would be blessed by them, through them, and those that blessed them would be blessed. Those that cursed them would be cursed. But that was if. First of all, the, the scripture that was originally quoted that we looked at was originally to Abraham. And then when the covenant was made with Israel, it was a conditional covenant. We know this right here from Deuteronomy 28. But Deuteronomy 28 tells us something else. It also gives a prophecy that explains why all of the things that have happened to the Jewish people for the last 2,000 years have happened. Um, ever since the Jewish diaspora, since 70 AD, when the Romans destroyed the temple and destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the Jews were scattered all over the world. Everywhere they went, they were <laughs> they were literally seen as a plague on whatever nation and and land that they took refuge in, and they have been run out of more places than any other people in the history of the world. They've moved from place to place to place, and that's because they've been run out of place after place. And the reason for that is given in Deuteronomy 28. It's prophesied in verse 37. It says in Deuteronomy 28, 37, And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations, wherever the Lord shall lead thee. Thou shalt be a scourge upon the people and all the nations, whether the Lord shall lead thee. Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field and shall only gather in but a little, for the locust shall consume it. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but shall not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. The stranger that is within thee shall be above thee, and thou shall be down very low. He shall lend to thee, and, they, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. So, God prophesied that the children of Israel would be dispersed all over the four corners of the earth and that they would literally be a scourge on all of the people. In Jeremiah chapter uh, 29, verse 18. Let's see, Jeremiah... It says, Know that thus saith the Lord of the king that sitteth upon the throne of David and of all the people that dwelleth in this city. And this is, I started at verse 16. And of your brethren that are not gone forth with you into captivity. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send upon them the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, and will make them like vile figs that cannot be eaten. 
they are so evil. And I will persecute them with the sword, with the famine, and with the pestilence, and will deliver them to be removed to all the kingdoms of the earth to be a curse and an astonishment and a hissing and a reproach among all the nations whither I have driven them because they have not hearkened to my words, saith the Lord. Now, that is another prophecy by God through the prophet Jeremiah that tells them that everywhere they go, they are going to be seen as a reproach and, and a curse among all the nations that they are driven into. And in Jeremiah chapter 25, it says, From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even unto this day that is the three and twentieth year, the word of the Lord hath come unto me, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye have not hearkened. And the Lord hath sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. They say, Turn ye again now, every one from his evil ways and from the evil of your doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given you, hath given unto you and to your fathers for ever and ever. And go not after other gods to serve them, and worship them, and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands, and I will do you no hurt. Yet ye have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof. So I want to point something out here. <laughs> this is more proof, like the ultimate proof that this was a conditional promise. If it ever applied to Israel at all, it was a conditional promise. And this is proven because Nebuchadnezzar, uh, not only attacked Israel or Judah and took them into captivity, but before that, he came and he set up a puppet king, so to speak, a vassal king. If that is not the definition of cursing them, I mean, he does, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians definitely weren't blessing Israel. Um, they weren't blessing the Jews there. And they were the Jews. This was the nation of Judah. The Israelis, the, nation, the uh, kingdom of Israel, had already been carried off and scattered uh, among the whole world when they were taken captive by the Assyrians. So we already saw with the northern tribes that when they did not obey they were taken captive into Assyria and not only taken captive but the Lord divorced them and they were spread among all the nations now for doing the same thing that the kingdom of Israel did now the kingdom of Judah is also being taken captive. Many were killed. Many more were killed than were taken captive. The only ones that were taken captive were the wise men and the the strong, healthy, you know, the, the youth. And he not only, Nebuchadnezzar not only uh, sacked the city, took them captive, but he did what? He destroyed the temple. He destroyed the temple. He destroyed Solomon's temple. So, if that, if the destruction of that temple did not show that the promise of 
I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you did not apply to Israel, at least not unless they uh, kept the covenant that was established at Mount Sinai, then I don't know what does. And we're talking about the Old Testament Israelites. This is before the Jews flat out rejected the Son of God and put him to death. But we're going to get there. We're going to get there because the argument isn't for the Old Testament Israelites. Every argument I've heard is only about this uh, Rothschild-sponsored nation that was set up in 1948, which that in itself just shows me how much people don't understand about the Bible and about who is Israel and who is not. But that's neither here nor there. And like I said, I am not attacking anybody. I am just stating facts. Uh, I want to I go to the New Testament and I want to show what Jesus said because what Jesus said says it all. I mean, flat out, point blank, what Jesus said says it all. Now, I want to go first to Luke chapter 21. We're going to look, look at Luke chapter 21 really quick. And we're going to see if the Bible has anything to say about Israel in modern times. And when I say modern times, I mean the last 2,000 years. Now, Jesus said in Luke chapter 21, he said actually quite a bit. He says a lot of the same things he said in Matthew 24, some of the things he said in Luke 17, but he prophesies the destruction of both Jerusalem and the temple, and he he says, starting in verse 20, he says, And when ye shall see Jerusalem, and a lot of people want to say that this is talking about end times, like the time we're in now or future, but it's not. I mean, it's clearly not. Um, it's clearly talking about the time that Jesus was in now. Um, you know, <laughs> Jesus shows this completely with Luke 17 and Luke 21, it, it, those who want to say that all of Matthew 24 is pointing at end times, they really don't have a, le a leg to stand on because there are parallel passages in Mark and in Luke. And in those parallel passages, it shows that Jesus does say things that are talking about the tribulation, but not through the entire uh, chapter of 24. But back to Luke 21. We're going to go to Matthew 24 in a second. But Jesus says, uh, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. The desolation or destruction thereof. Thereof, thereof what? Jerusalem. When ye shall see Jerusalem surrounded with armies, then ye shall know the destruction thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let them that are in the countries enter therein too. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe, and see, this is how I say, this is why I say, that Matthew 24 is not talking about the end times in the entire chapter because this is the par one of the parallel passages and this is one of the parallel verses that most people know. But woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Well, what people is he talking about? I mean, he tells us, starting right here in verse 20, Jerusalem. He's talking about the Jewish people. He says in verse 24, 
And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, this is prophecy. It's prophecy that began in 70 AD and it's prophecy that you could argue ended in 1948. However, there is nowhere, nowhere in scripture that says when the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, then those who bless the 1948 Zionist established state of Israel will be blessed and those that cursed the Luciferian Zionist will be cursed. I mean, does that make any sense? Those who bless the Luciferian, Kabbalistic, idolatrous nation of Israel will be blessed, but those who curse them will be cursed. I mean, no, it doesn't. And you can't say, well, it does make sense because they're God's people. Mm, that's not what my Bible says. My Bible is very clear that in the New Covenant, Israel is not a physical nation. It's a spiritual nation. And it is made up of all peoples, regardless of their the blood running through their veins. And I can tell you 100% how I know that just because the Jewish, the the ethnically Jewish people uh, came back into the land of Palestine or Judea in 1948 does not all of a sudden make them God's chosen people again because Jesus said so. How do I know Jesus said so? Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 21 and let's see what Jesus said. Go to Matthew chapter 21 and let's see what Jesus said about it. Matthew chapter 21. Jesus, let's, let's start. Let's see, where's the best place to start? But let's start with 28. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterwards he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go. But he went not. Whether of them, whether of the twain of them did the will of his father, they said unto him, The first. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of, the, in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the, public, but the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterwards that ye might believe him. Hear another parable, and this is the important one. Hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard, and hedged it round about, and dug a wine press in it. And he built a tower, and let it out to husbandmen, and went away into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruit of it. And the husbandmen took his servants, and beat one, and killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent more servants than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will surely receive and reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said amongst themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, 
and cast him out of the vineyard, and they slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto these husbandmen? They said unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him into powder. So, reading the parable here, and what Jesus said to the Pharisees, religious leaders, the Jewish people here, he, um, <laughs> he is talking about the Old Testament, because remember, on Israel, Israel, who killeth the prophets, okay, uh, he is talking all through this parable, and starting with verse 33, about the land and, and the people of Israel who were the kingdom of God for all intents and purposes. They were God's chosen, right? Going all the way back to the original covenant, when it was a physical covenant that required physical sacrifices constantly for their sins. And it had all of these laws and ordinances that they must keep. And it is during all of this time that Jesus is talking about when he says, he tells them the parable of the householder who is God the Father, who planted a vineyard, which is, for all intents and purposes, the not necessarily the land of Israel itself, but the chosenness that comes with being sons and daughters of the Most High. The, the church is called a nation of priests and kings. The church is uh, now called the light of the world. And those are the things that the nation of Israel was called in the Old Testament. And it is the Old Testament nation of Israel that Jesus is talking about here. The husbandman is God the Father. The, the householder, husbandman, no, excuse me, the, the householder is God the Father. The husbandman is Old Testament, the Old Testament nation of Israel, all the way up until the New Testament nation of Israel. And he literally tells of the servants. The servants that are sent to them are the prophets, the Old Testament prophets that they killed. Jesus points this out to them. And of course, the son of the householder is Jesus. And not only did they kill the prophets, but they killed the son. Because of this, Jesus tells them, in verse 43, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. That's right. Christ spoke from Psalm 118.22. That's right. He said, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Which is exactly what those of us in the New Covenant nation of Israel, the New Covenant Israel of God, are supposed to do. We are supposed to bear fruit. All through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us to bear fruit. Matter of fact, Jesus calls himself the true vine, and we are the branches. And he says every branch, regardless to whether you are, and, and he was not speaking to an audience of Gentiles in the Sermon on the Mount because the Gentiles had not yet been given the gospel. But he's talking about everyone, Jew or Gentile, every branch, whether it is uh, 
wild branch that has been grafted in, or it is a natural branch that has been grafted in. It, Jesus says every branch that does not produce fruit withers and dies and is cut off and cast into the fire. This is just the doctrine of Christ. This is just good theology. So to say that the United States is cursed because one of many puppet leaders told the Zionist nation of Israel that the, they had no right to the Temple Mount is it's just crazy. Because there is only one Israel of God in the New Covenant. The only people in God's eyes who have the right to be called sons and daughters of the Most High are those who have accepted and chosen to follow the Son of God. Those who who are in a covenant relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ, who is God the Son. Point blank, period. Now, I've already been on here for quite a while, and, you know, I don't have much more time because I've got other things I've got to do today. But I've done many, many, many uh, episodes. I've preached many sermons on the New Covenant and on who... Israel in the New Covenant is that you can find right here on YouTube um, who Israel is, who are God's chosen people. There are several episodes of the Remnant Report on that. There are several sermons that you can find here and on YouTube about that. But regardless, as far as who will be cursed and won't be cursed, the, the ethnic nation of Israel has absolutely, absolutely nothing to do. Only in as much that by blessing them, by ministering to them, you are obeying the commandments of Christ and bearing fruit. That is the only way that you will be blessed by blessing them. And if you're cursing anybody, then, you know, you're going to be cursed because you can't be in the kingdom of God and curse people. To minister doesn't mean to stand up in a pulpit and preach. To minister means to meet the needs of others. So if you bless someone by ministering to them, by helping them, whether it's uh, helping them physically, financially, uh, by spreading the gospel to them, whatever you're doing, if you're doing that to anybody, then God's going to bless you for it. It doesn't have to be someone who is of a certain ethnicity. God could care less what color your skin is, God could care less where you were born. What God cares about is whether or not you have been reconciled to him through his son. Whether or not you have chosen to be born again after you have followed the example of Christ and crucified your flesh. Put your flesh to death after you have died to yourself and been reborn. In the spirit, Jesus said, in order to enter into the kingdom of God, you must be born of water and of spirit. People believe that that is talking about water baptism and then laying on of hands. That's not what Jesus was talking about. Jesus said, everyone must be born of both water and of spirit. Well, guess what? Everybody, no matter who you are, has been born of water. When you are born from your mother, physically, you are born of water. But Jesus didn't leave it at being born of water. He said, you must be born of water 
and of spirit. In other words, you must be born again. You must be born twice. You must be born physically, and then, what do he say? Born again. You must be born of spirit. Now, are we to be baptized? Yes. Being baptized is being obedient. It's also uh, representing us going into the grave and coming back out, being born again, dying to our flesh and being reborn in the spirit. And then are we supposed to have hands laid upon us? Yes, that's the way it's done in the Bible. It's the way it was done in the early church. And it's the way it should be done now. But I hope that I didn't lose anybody. I hope that you all understood what I said today. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, message Kingdom Productions. It should be up there. I, I've got the uh, messenger thing turned on where you can... Uh, Send your uh, questions, statements, comments, whatever you can comment here, um, even after the uh, video's over, and I will respond. I try to respond to all of the comments, and I thank you all for listening to my long-winded explanation. I love each and every one of you. Until next time, grace and peace. <laughs> The Spirit of God is moving upon His people and He is raising up a generation that is prepared for power that will touch this world.